preaching these is love, and we spent the last month and a bit talking about love and how we interact with love, whether that be you know in chronic illness or mental health struggles to through the different stages of our life. Uh, and then last week was how to love your neighbor, but we had just a really loud game that you're we really forced to love your neighbor. <laughs> Tonight is the hardest part of love we're going to talk about. But I want you to think about when you have something that is really important and valuable that you want to get across to someone for their own good, but you know that it's not going to be easy. You know that they may or probably are stuck in a certain way of thinking. Maybe stubborn, you know, and, and you just know it's going to be a tougher conversation. How do you deliver it? It's really important to get this message across. Anybody? Yeah, what would you do? Well, can what I said to you the other day. Oh, thank you. You should not lie. You want to have that life? You're Well, maybe have a death Yeah, so when we really want to get something across, we tend to do things like exaggerate, use hyperboles, stretch it for one reason, so that it grabs their attention. If we use our normal ways of communication, just kind of talking, it kind of, you know, just rolls right by them. Jesus, when he came, walked right into that situation. He walked into a situation where the people of God, the Israelites, still loved God, but they were stuck. They had ventured somewhat, varying degrees, I'm sure, away from God in their heart. And they were stuck in rules and regulations and systems and all these things, ways to do things. And Jesus knew when he came to the planet Earth, it wasn't going to be easy to get this good news across. Why did he come? He came to seek and to save what was lost. The problem was, is most people really didn't think they were lost. So how do you get the message across? How do you help them pay attention so you're just not some other prophet or somebody else just saying the same thing? And so when we look at Jesus and the way he communicated, we can learn a lot how to get an important message. Jesus used very absolute words. Must. Cannot. Why? Why? Because when we don't use those types of words, people don't pay attention. Especially if they're stuck. You know, you can use beautiful language like, hey, I didn't like you to do this. And if a person's heart's in, a, in the right place, in a good space, that's awesome. They will do it. But that's not necessarily the situation he was walking into. That's not necessarily the situation we're often in. And so he uses very strong language <laughs> often. He used hyperboles. Like this one. Think of this. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry this cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. When he said this, did he mean that we are to hate our parents? Yes. And our spouse and our children, and ourselves. No. He did not. And so we explain it, and we go, well, when Jesus said this, he meant to love less. But that's not what he said. What if he would have said, I want you to love less? We wouldn't be preaching about it tonight. It catches your attention. It slows you down. It makes you stop and think. 
And that's one of the reasons why Jesus used that strong language and made people just stop in their tracks. All they wanted was your attention for a minute. Instead of the attitude, I know. Yeah, I've heard that. I understand it. I've read it a thousand times. And so he said, very strong to stop you. You can't read that and go, whoa, 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 wait a second. I'm supposed to hate you. And there's truth in it, right? There, there actually is truth because he's talking, obviously, about loving God so much, putting God, you know, number one so much that the rest looks like hate. Because if we truly do love God, we're able to love these people better. And in all, in all honesty, without God, we end up hating most of those people on that list. Right? So he used this language to help draw us in. To slow us down, to get our attention, so we would evaluate and think. Well, that's what tonight is about. Evaluating and thinking. Probably no answers will be given. Because it is the toughest, toughest part of love that we're going to look at. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, you're in the crowd. Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount to you. And this is what he says. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise in the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Love your enemies. And he says, there's really no difference between loving your enemies and loving your name. Why does he make that comparison? Why does he make that connection? Because unfortunately, the Israelites had made that distinction. They, they had very strategically designed and, and, and defined what their neighbor was and who they were to love. They had become very insular in their love and very exclusive in their love. And then they had a whole bunch of people that honestly they just hated. And then when you look at it later on, he talks about that, doesn't he? Jesus connects these two. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And when you look in the Gospel of Luke, what story follows that? The good who? Samaritan. What did the Jews and the Samaritans think of each other? A mutual loathe, the hate. They did not like each other. It was hate. And it stems way back to the Assyrian time. And so for, you know, whatever, 700 years, they had hated each other. They had nothing to do with each other. They would not associate with each other. They disrespected each other. And so Jesus says, love your neighbor, and then he points out that your neighbor is the Samaritan. And actually, the Samaritan is the hero. So he flips everything upside down. It's so hard for us to grasp the intensity of what is going on here. I couldn't even think of a modern-day example. I really couldn't. You know, how to flip the table. Where, you know, they would read that and go, what, the Samaritan is the good person? <clears throat> and how convicting that would be. Again, it was a shock statement to make him stop and go, whoa, whoa no wonder he got killed by him. That's how mad he made something. Because he needed to get this message of love through. And it's a tough message. Just think you're in there. What does it mean to love your enemy? For some of us, when we hear the word enemy, we can actually write a list very fast. And we can think of a lot of people, personality types, even or whatever. Then we say, yeah, that's an enemy. Then there's others. They think they don't have any enemies. They are what we call the deceived people. 
<laughs> everybody has been rubbed the wrong way. Everybody has been hurt. Everybody has, you know, had a conversation with somebody and said, and said to themselves, sometimes out loud, I don't like you. There's, there's really nothing I like about you. So as you can see, it, it can be very easy because we're human. Of course, we should love, but do we? Do we love the criminal, the person who hurt us, the person who hurt the people we love, the betrayer, the person who gossiped, gossiped against us or slandered us, the person who is self-righteous, the person who is always right, the person who is too soft, the person who is too hard, the person who does not like what we like or, or think like we think. We could go on and on and make a list. See, there is no middle ground. It's love or hate. But we always like to, it's like when we say the Bible with people, maybe you say the Bible with a lot of people, right? You're studying with them, and, 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 and you get to this point, and you talk about light and darkness, and you ask them, where are you? Well, I'm kind of in the middle of the gray. And they go, he wasn't in there. There's no gray. Because <laughs> nobody likes to say, well, I'm in the dark. Every once in a while, somebody's honest, and goes, yeah, I'm totally in the dark, man. You know, usually what they say is, well, you know, I'm working towards the light. No, say it. <laughs> Come on, spit it out, turn the dark. And it's the same principle here. Can we admit and see where the struggle will be and how difficult it is? That's why Jesus came. That's why he says in the scripture, he goes, anybody can love somebody they love. It's easy peasy. The tax collectors, the pagans, the heathens can do that. But loving someone that you can't love takes Jesus. To me, that's intriguing. And it's real. Because there's lots of people like that on my own. But there's hope that with Jesus, I can. And through him, I can. That's pretty cool and exciting. That's the goal of what Jesus, he knew. He, he knows we're sinners. He knows we're going to blame. We, we're going to hurt each other. We're not going to like each other. We're going to hate each other. He knows that's going to happen. But he, he sees the good in us. And he says, you know what? No. With me and me as your power and me as your strength, you can love. You can move on. You can forgive. You can do it on your own. You can. Just realize that. Be okay. You know what I think was one of the greatest demonstrations of Jesus' love, other than obviously dying on the cross? <clears throat> this one. This one is really wild. So he's going to the cross. And he says, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve arrived. With him, you know, was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had a range of signal with him. The one I kiss is the man arrested. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. He kissed him. Jesus replied, Friends, do what you can. One of the twelve. Your closest twelve. Now, we also know how this story keeps unraveling, right? All of them have betrayed Jesus. All of them turned their back at this one blows me away. This was the evil one. This was Judas who totally went to the dark side. This is Judas that totally went off the rails. And Jesus knew it. And he brings a gang with him. And Jesus could have stopped him. Jesus could have blown him up. Jesus could have, like, endless amounts of things that would go through my brain, Jesus could have done. And he did. He said, friend, <laughs> friend, and it wasn't a sarcastic friend. It was friend. You're my friend. Imagine being Judas in that moment. One of two things. Either he felt really guilty or he's already so hard hearted it just didn't even face it. Mm -hmm. friend, do what you can do. Peter was slicing off ears and, you know, just was, put that away. This is our friend. What a demonstration of what it means to love your enemies. 
called them friend. So how do we love our enemy? How do we do it? But one thing I think we need to distinguish is some different words. I think we get it mixed up with love. So there is the word love. But then there's acceptance, approval, and agreement. They're not all the same. Meaning, you can love someone without accepting what they're doing, without approving their actions, without agreeing with their approach or wow, what or how they're doing it. Like this, did Jesus love Judas? Oh, you gotta kinda answer that one. Yes. Did he accept what Judas, Judas was doing? Kind of. But he didn't accept it in the sense of, that's really great that you're putting me up for us and you betrayed me. No, he didn't do that. Did he agree with it? No, he didn't. Right? And he didn't, you know, he didn't agree or approve. So you can love someone and not agree with them and not accept their actions and not, you know, approve of it either. You know, it's that old phrase. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Easier said than that. Because we think they're the same. But how do we separate that out? The sinner from the sin. This has always been difficult for me. How do I discern what love is? How do I know my heart is coming from a place of love? Because that's important to ask that question. How would we know? How to hate sin, but not the sinner. When it's easy, it's easy. When it's not, it's not. Did Jesus love the Pharisees? You know, we got to answer yes, right? <laughs> Do you believe he loved the Pharisees? No. Like, look at this. This is just one little snippet. I call it the Pharisee rant. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one of you, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Oh, we can read the whole chapter, the seven woes they call. But did, did Jesus love the Pharisees? No. Yes. yes, he did. But that doesn't appear to be loved. He tore a strip off. Did Jesus love the Pharisees? No. Now, you're there. You don't know Jesus. You haven't even really heard too many stories about it. And you witness this. What do you think of Jesus now? Thank you, John. Our automatic would be, wow, what a mean person. What a judgmental person. How many times have we overheard someone speaking and we made those same sort of judgments? We didn't know. How many people would have judged Jesus and did that judge Jesus? Because, hey, you know, shortly after that, it was the cross. <laughs> because they didn't get the time or they didn't make the time to get to know the Son of God. And to know that love displays itself in many different ways. So what's going on? Is he accepting their actions? Is he approving of what they were doing? No. But he loved them. Yes. I think any parent can understand this. You just get it. You know, there's a time when your children need a good Pharisee rant. That's what we'll call it. And I've given Pharisee rants. You know, where they needed to be disciplined, they needed some stronger language, they needed some must and cannots. And you know what? Here's the cool thing about being a parent. You know when you did it right, and you know when you did it wrong. See, we have the spirit. We are guided. There is a conscience within us that God put in us. 
And I know, I know when I'm alone with my kids. I know that when my Pharisee rant was from Satan, when it was my evil, sinful nature, I know when I walked away from that conversation or that discipline or that it wasn't because I loved them. It's because they were my enemy at that point. But I also know, almost exactly the same tone, almost exactly the same delivery, almost exactly everything the same, but the heart was different. And I walked away totally different. <laughs> That's the key. It's not so much the words, right? It's not so much even the tone. It's where is that coming from? Am I addressing my enemy or my neighbor? Am I addressing my enemy or someone I love? That's the key. It's the heart. And you know what? Here's the funny thing is I don't think anybody else can determine that other than you. Your spouse could be watching you and going, well, he's gone off the rails. <laughs> Woo, hope the kids make it through this one. And she doesn't have a clue. Or he, if that was the good part, or the not. See how much grace we got to give each other? How hard it is to give benefit of doubt? How easily we would have thrown Jesus under the bus if we didn't know him, and we heard him speak like that. As a parent, you know. You know if it's out of the frustration and the wrong type of anger. You know. And you feel really rotten there. But again, if other people saw you, what would they think? Jesus didn't care. Jesus didn't care because he loved the Pharisees. So he didn't care. He didn't care what other people thought of his rant, of how he was addressing. He didn't care. I'm sure he knew that many would judge him. I'm sure he knew that many would, you know, misinterpret what he was doing, but he didn't care. Jesus cared about love. He knew that in order to love the Pharisees, to get it through their thick skulls, and to break some of the traditions that were so deeply entwined, he would have to take this approach with at least some of them. How effective was it? We have no idea. Well, the day of Pentecost was pretty effective, so maybe it was planting in water. The point was, is Jesus loved no matter what. He could have thought of himself. How am I going to love but he didn't because he cared more about them. It's not an easy topic. If you see them as an enemy, it won't be love. If you see them as someone who is harassed and helpless, who is a child of God, who is needing you, then there's more of a chance it will be love. If you see them as a neighbor, it will be love. It's not an easy time. Don't ever take this life. We're full of hurt. We're full of judgment. Hurt people hurt people. It's the way it works. We all have stories. We all have histories that affect us and affect our interactions with people or how we perceive interactions, how we see interactions. We can't help that our first thing is, is our story transposed onto that story. And so we tend to unfortunately find people who have the same similar story so that we can share that similar experience. But that's not always love, is it? That's too easy. But somebody with a different story, a different perspective, now that is love. And in so many ways, more fulfilling. The way we approach one another and the way we approach the Word of God, that's the key. So as I was thinking about this, because, you know, it's too easy to make excuses. It's too easy to find somebody to agree with me that that is my enemy. So what does it take? To at least be aware, to be trying, to be heading in that direction towards Jesus. Well, I think the first thing is, is and I alluded to it, you know, especially with a parent and a child, 
This is the Holy Spirit. If you're a disciple today, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have God residing in you. He's there. I know sometimes it's hard to hear him because we're too loud. Right? We're too busy. I get that. But learning, constantly learning to open up to listen to the Holy Spirit. I think in Galatians 5, 22, not 19, by the way, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such saying there is no law, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and ending one another. And you know, this whole chapter is about freedom. It's all about how we've been set free, but then how we crawl back into slavery and we allow things to overtake us. And hate is one of those major things. Making people our enemies is just, just almost second nature to us. But love, staying in step with the Spirit. Because the Spirit produces those things. And with those things, there isn't the hate. There isn't the enemy. It's when those things aren't present or not at the, the level that we need them that the hate overtakes and the enemy appears. Stay in step with the Spirit. We were set free, but slavery chased us. Slavery likes to lash back. Our slavery to overreact to situations. That's a big one for me. You know, I thought years ago I had a handle on that. You know, I was taught, discipled, trained by, you know, a spiritual father of mine as such that, Ray, don't react, respond. Slow down the process. You know, and for, yeah, it's one of those things you think, I'm going to work at this, and then stop acting. You start to get hurt, or things don't work out, and then guess what? Slavery reappears. I started to react instead of respond. React instead of respond. Here we go again. And I can feel very defeated, but it doesn't. <laughs> because I like the response rate much more than the reactive rate. And that's the key. We're going to fall. We're going to stumble. Life's going to build up on us. Situations and circumstances are going to overtake us at different times. It's going to happen. That doesn't need to be the end of the story. The end of the story needs to be this. I can get back up. I'm still free in Christ. Jesus is still there. His grace and his mercy will cover me. I am going to get back in step or get closer to the Holy Spirit. That's the key. We need the Holy Spirit. We need that gift to be present and accounted for in our life and in our actions. Walk with the Spirit. How? How do we stay more in step? How do we stay closer to this Holy Spirit so that our sinful nature and our slavery doesn't keep creeping in and overtaking us? It really is simple, which makes it complex for us. Because we want complex answers. Because our situations are complex. And, and God goes, no, it's really quite simple. It's this simple. The word of God is living and active, sharper, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide and soul into your joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid, laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. What's the key? The Bible. What's the key? The Word of God. What's the key? Get in there. What's the key? Get in there again. What's the key? Get in there again. Sounds way too simple. No, it's not. And it is. We make it complex. Get into your Bible and allow Jesus, allow the Word to transform you, to slice and dice you, to change you. Unfortunately, we get complicated. And then we complicate it more by bringing in more and more people into our issues. Instead of first and foremost bringing them to God. And getting in his word. I've got some advice for all of us. 
When somebody comes to you and they want to share something, or they're struggling in something, or they're overwhelmed with something, first thing, ask them this. Have you been with God? Yeah, I have. What did that look like? Right? And they pray. Like, truly pray, God, why are you doing this to me? That's not praying. That's breaking into a prayer. And how's your time in his word? It's that simple. That's the key. Don't make it compli more complicated than it is. If God is God, he will help you through it. If Jesus is who he says he was and is, he will help. Again, it's not that we don't need relationships, we do, but they have their place. And that place is behind our relationship with God. And that's a key. You know, I'm going to use an example of a person she really loves this when I do this because she loves the attention. My wife, um, she's extremely irritated by the way. Um, she, Stephanie is irritated because she takes a very simple approach. And she gives what I would think, in my arrogance and my pride and my hoity toity attitude, <laughs> simple answers. Like, well, what are you reading in the Bible? No, I want to read this. Come on. She diligently every day, and I can't remember her day where she did not. If she did, she made sure she made that. She dies. She's so convinced. I'm going to get up and do other things sometimes. You know, with that. But she dies it. She keeps it simple. It works. Don't make it so complex, people. Right? Ordinary and schooled men and women. That's who Jesus picked. Why? Maybe because they were able to keep it a little simpler. Maybe. Just maybe. Maybe my degrees just get in the way. And I think I'm just smarter than Jesus now. And that's the key. And that's the piece that I want you to walk away with this. Walk with the Spirit. But to walk with the Spirit, we've got to get in His Word. We've got to make sure that that is the force that is driving us. And prayer, real prayer, where we're connecting with our Father, not just blaming or upsetting. But getting to that point of peace with God so that we can bring peace to the world. And then, and only then, do we have any hope of loving our enemy and making those strengths. So my encouragement is, Love your enemy. Look at them differently, and you can't unless you're walking with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your word that you sent Jesus as an example. And Father, that you are always trying to simplify, and we are always trying to comment. Father, I pray for each and every one of us. I pray we will all just turn to you. You've given us the Holy Spirit. You've given us what we need. You've given us your Bible, your word, your very God written words. Help us to believe that. God, give us that fire and that excitement to know that when we open your book, you're speaking to us. The creator of everything is speaking to us. Help us to revere that, to respect that, to honor that, to give it the right voice, the right play within our hearts and within our minds. Help us, Father, to never believe that the world can do so. Help us to always know that you can, that you are with us, that you are walking with us in the Spirit, and that you want us to live free lives. Father, give us the courage, give us the strength to see our enemies as our neighbor, to see our enemies as rest and helpless, to see our enemies as your children. Father, we love you. We thank you for believing in us, for your grace and mercy to forgive us, and just your words that empower us to take the next step. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Have a good night.